Hello and welcome. This video will show you the sample implementation of Tracer, uh, an in-house product of the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg's Animation Institute, implemented in the LBX example. Um, the European Media and Immersion Lab, short EMIL, um, it's funded by European Union's Horizon Europe and Research and Innovation Program. Um, the LBX example is, as you can read here, the sample implementation that shows you how the Film Academy Tracer framework can be used to create location-based experiences. What is Tracer? Tracer is a toolset for real-time animation collaboration and extended reality. It's, as already mentioned, an in-house product of the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg's Animation Institute. It's open source, it's engine agnostic and it's available on GitHub. It's also important to say that this is a Unity implementation of the network components. As Tracer is engine agnostic, it can be used as a template to implement it to any other engine or DCC. This project shows you the sample implementation of how we used it in the EMI Lighthouse project Fate of the Minor Tower. That's why most of the scripts, for example, have the scene object Mino and the Mino interactable. That's the in-house working title of this project. In this video, I uh, want to show you the upcoming points of the player joining progress, fun with physics, push buttons, elevator, spawning entities, and script templates. So let's dive right into. Um, once you've downloaded this project from GitHub, this is the GitHub link. Um, you, of course, need to install the Unity version. We use the 22.3.41. Um, once you've opened the project, you need to uh, download and install the Text Mesh Pro plugin so it all is working. Then you can go into the player scene and I show you the player joining progress. Um, at first, you need a data hub. Uh, the tool is designed to work peer to peer, but we need a data hub to run on one client to emit all the uh, network data. So once you've downloaded the data hub from this GitHub, it's public as well and open source, you have a look at it like this. You go there with the console, start the executable. Once the DLL is loaded, you can start the data hub with this command. Own IP, you can use your local home or you can use your local IP address. Um, whether you want to run it on the network with other clients or if you want to run multiple instances just on your client. The IP you entered here need to be entered on the Tracer core as well. The Tracer core is the core script. Um, if you run multiple instances of the editor, I can suggest you the tool Parallel Sync to do so, or if you run multiple executables of the build version, you need to uh, check the use random CID, because we have random, uh, we have unique IDs to determine which player is which in the network, and we use the last digit of the network address. And if you run it locally on one client, it's of course the same address, and then we need random IPs. And so you can start the editor version. I start a build version of the same of the same of the same version as well. And every um, every scene has a video of how it works as well. So you can dive right into it and can play it as well. So here you see the blue player and the green player. The blue player always is the, <coughs> the master. Um, we don't have a master where everything is executed, but to determine which objects have the first authority on which client, we need some kind of a master. And I want to show you the definition of master and lock. So on this client, you see we have the player character. The player character has the minor character script and it's not locked. And this client, the blue one, also has this object. Um, but on our client, he is the replicate. The replicate is locked. Locked means the object will never emit any data into the network and I can't change it because it will always receive data from the client who is locking it. 
So that's about the master and locking. And of course I can join even more players. Um, you will recognize that the position at the beginning of the players are wrong. Since we only emit data that changed so that we can reduce the network traffic and uh, it's not implemented right now that we emit the data once when the player joins but feel free to do so. But once everything is set up um, they are on the same position. Okay. Next will be the physical cubes. Uh, the physical cubes, I show you the better understanding of locking and what are UIDs. So the physical cube scene, I will start it to show you on the example. So as you can see all the physical objects are right now green, so I have the authority over all these things. Here we have another client and he does not have the authority. Now he has the authority because he joined with a lower network ID and we kind of emulate the master on the client with the lowest network ID. So if he runs into the objects because we implemented uh, locking on collisions he will gain the authority and can simulate all them because otherwise if they are locked um, as shown here, you can't change the positions. Now we have a script um, on the inspector where we can gain a lock on this client. So if I press this one here, he becomes green and is red on all other clients because they cannot emit any network data right now and we can change these here. And if I put it right between the towers, you can see it's there right between the towers as well. And if you can see in the inspector on the top right, if I um, hit the object, it becomes locked on the other client. So that's how locking works. Um, what about the UIDs? Every object that has a scene object minor or inherits it from the scene object will have a unique ID, which we need to determine in the network which object uh, gets what uh, network data. And if we ever um, change anything on this count in the editor, for example, if I put in another cube, I need to use tools and create UID so we have the new version. Right now I can't play with the build, uh, with the other builds because they don't have this. Um, and if you lock it, if you delete it, you need to do this as well. Um, so what's next? We can push some buttons. Because here I want to show you where to execute your events. We could execute this button for example only on the master. As you can see here it's implemented in only by the master. So everyone can trigger this but the event will be transferred in the network and only the master executed. So let's keep this going as well and we will see who becomes the master, so who will be the blue one. Um, yeah, this one is the master. So when I get into this button nothing happens, but on the master the pressed count has increased. And this is the same for when the master gets it. But you see there's no change on the other client. So this one will be executed on the one who is triggering it. So if I go into it, it's pressed one, two, three, four, five times and it's not executed on the other client. And if I go in there, so there's this as well. And now the last one, which um, is by and for everyone. So I go into it, I trigger it and it will be triggered on every client as well. So as you can see. So then we have this little sequence which is played once and we have this sequence 
which is played um, ongoing all the time. And you can see how it is synced as well. And you should go for the implementation that reduces the network's traffic uh, as much as possible so that you are executing local events where it's possible. I will show you this very easily on the elevator scene. Uh, the elevator, what about parenting? So we have buttons like before. Now we have some moving platforms as well. So as you can see, we have the only on the master uh, position update. So the button can be pressed by everyone, but this coroutine is only executed on the master and the platform has a script scene object minor which is not locked so it's not locked on the master for example on this client it's locked because he's not the master and the update of the position will come from the master as you can see and if we run into this button it's executed on the master and the platform from the master from the green client will send its update to us this, for example, is executed only locally. So this platform is locked from the beginning and this is never changed. And if I run into it, I will execute it locally on my position and all other clients will execute this as well. So what about the parenting? Um, if I select my player character, which is right now not uh, parented to anything, and he will go onto this platform. As you can see, he's now parented to this platform. And when he is triggering the up and down, he will send its local position update to this platform. So if this client goes on this platform, and I will move this platform, he will come with me. And as you can see, he is here as well. And then there's another possibility where we can use these buttons, which will gain the lock on the one who is triggering the button. So right now it's locked uh, for me, so I'm the master. I let it go up and down and it will be simulated on my client. As you can see in the moving platform, it's not locked and it's um, moving on him as well. Um, but as you can see, if I trigger the button here, it becomes locked on this one and it's simulated on this client. So if I can go up here and I will trigger this here and I can have fun with this. Yeah. Uh, the, the spawning entities. Um, as I already told you about the spawning entities, we need um, unique IDs for the clients to work with the network. So what about spawning? Um, the spawning happens that, as you can see, we have done previously pre pre with the buttons. Everyone can trigger the spawning. And the object will spawn here. So I have the authority right now. I can move it. I can move it back there. And you can see on the client it's there. The client could collide with it and then move it as well. Um, we do it in a way that where the object will be spawned, uh, an example here on the spawner, this client, or if you execute it only on the master, depends on what you want to do, this client will create a unique ID and tell the network, hey, I have this object with a unique ID and all clients will spawn the same object but use this unique ID. And that's where we can have fun with spawning objects. And once in this sample implementation they hit the red boxes below, they get deleted as well. And we need to make sure that they are deleted everywhere. OK. 
Okay. What's more, the return of the Guildies, and I show you the template of the script. So that's the Mino template script, and it inherits the scene object Mino. Um, and here we have a new defined RPC parameter type bool. We will override the generic awake from scene object, initialize this scene object, and here we initialize the parameter. So standard false, parameter changes name, and we have a parameter has changed function, and we have the parameter call, what we want to call from the client who is changing the object. And then there we have the generic destroy function. In the simulate region, I implemented a few extra so you can easily test uh, how it's working. And that's what I show you. How it's easily working. So every client can collide with this uh, cube. And then I have a sample implementation of the text mesh, what gets called and change the color of the material as well. I can see the green one, I can see the blue one. And if I hit the box, I will call the parameter has changed. And since I am triggering this, I will call the network parameter call with the negative of my current value. So it becomes true because we start false and true is green. And as you can see, I'm not gonna tell lies. Then we change it to red, green, and on this client we call the parameter has changed as well, <coughs> which will not emit any change because we're only receiving it. And the parameter change called is from the call on the on trigger. And we can enter it as well. So that's all for this moment's video. Thank you and goodbye.